Good morning from Greentown Wesleyan Church. I'm so glad that you're here to worship with us today on the internet, in the internet as we are right now. And it has been interesting to do the things that we need to do from the inside here to share with you and to connect with you. Um, being in here has been interesting. It's been strange a little bit. Um, to be honest, the internet is full of strange people with strange ideas. And um, there are a lot of them. Maybe you have been spending more time on the internet as well, on your phones or computers, sitting at home, and maybe you've run into some of these strange people. Maybe you're starting to become some of these strange people. I hope not. Um, but it has been interesting. It's been entertaining. One of the most interesting and entertaining groups of people that I have found here in the internet so far um, is, is the Flat Earth people. I've had more time than usual uh, to look at stuff and to look around, and these flat earth people, um, they have a lot of stuff to look at and to see. And well, I gotta tell you the truth. It's been really fun to find this stuff. And I gotta tell you the truth, what I've been reading is better than most sitcoms that people have been binge watching, and I wanted to share some of that with you. Now, now I want to start out by saying that 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 I really kind of think that a lot of the people that are into this um, are just messing around, um, and, and they're they're messing around with gullible people. Um, I'm not totally sure though. Uh, I I think that there are some people out there that are just having fun with the absurdity of these ideas, and I can appreciate that. I have also bumped into some of these people here on the internet that, um, man, they're 100% into it, and they really believe some of these views. So I wanted to share with you the gist of what this flat earth thing is all about. You've probably heard about it, but 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 I wanted to, to share some of the, the, the um, big picture stuff with you that, that I found. First of all, the earth is a giant flat disk like a pizza with all of the land on top of it and all of that land masses, all the continents are surrounded by oceans. Now that should raise a few questions. I hope that it raised a few questions as you consider that idea and that's good and that's okay. Um, and the great thing and what makes the flat earth thing so great is they are okay with questions. They get a lot of questions because this is what they think. And the wonderful thing about them is they have answers for all of these questions. They are not good answers. And most of their answers just provoke even more questions. But here on the internet, it seems like they have a lot of time to answer these questions. And these, these answers to these questions are fantastic. I wanna share some of those questions with you to start out and what their answers are. So first, it's a giant disc, flat disc, what what is keeping people from falling off the edge or from all of the water in the ocean from just running off the edge? Answer, the giant ice wall. The giant ice wall, it's what we call Antarctica and instead of being at the bottom of our round planet, it actually sits around the edges of our big flat disk that we live on according to this theory. Um, and it keeps all of the water from running off the edge or from people falling off the edge, it keeps everything inside, but some of them say it also keeps bad stuff on the outside. And when I read about that, I stopped following that train because I didn't wanna know what might be on the outside of the giant ice wall that it's protecting us from. Second question, why can't we fly airplanes over and see over the edge of this ice wall and, and, and how then do we fly an airplane from what seems like one side of the planet to the other side of the planet without seeing over the edge? Answer, the Pac-Man effect. Not making this one up, this is, this is what they say, the Pac-Man effect. It's kind of like playing the old video game Pac-Man. When you get to one side of the map and you're moving across instantaneously, you're teleported to the other side of the map and you can pick up from there. The Pac-Man effect magically keeps us from finding out what's over the edge or from accidentally flying our planes over the edge. Next question, what about seasons? That one's easy. The sun, which revolves around the disk of the earth, uh, it, it is closer to different parts of the earth at different times, so it makes it warmer or cooler. What about gravity? 
That's an easy question too. Uh, there's no such thing as gravity. What they say is the whole flat disk and the, the sky and the heavens and the planets above us are constantly moving upwards really, really fast. And that's why things stay pressed down to the ground. Um, and it feels like gravity, but there's there's really no such thing as that. Um, next question, what about the pictures from outer space and all of the people that have been in space and seen that it's actually round? Um, the answer to that is NASA and all of those people are in on one big conspiracy to, to trick us, and all of those photographs have been doctored. It's a lot of work to keep us tricked. And uh, to try to prove that last point, a number of flat earth people have been trying to raise the money to launch their own rockets into space to be able to go up and see the truth for themselves and to be able to prove it to the rest of us. This hasn't quite worked out yet. There was one man in California that built a steam power rocket and launched himself up into the sky a few times. Unfortunately, he died in a rocket accident in California last year. The highest that he got in his rocket was about 1,500 feet, which um, if you've been in an airplane and, and you've been to around 35,000 feet, you can start to see the curvature of the earth at the time. I've seen it. It's it's round, um, but from 1,500 feet, it would have still indeed looked very flat. Um, back in 2017, Elon Musk, who is the uh, owner of Tesla and SpaceX, SpaceX is a company working very hard on sending the first human beings to Mars. Uh, Elon Musk got online and he, he asked a question. It was a good question. He said, why is there only a flat Earth society and not a flat Mars society? Elon Musk wants to send people to Mars. He spends more time thinking about Mars than he does about Earth, probably. So he's interested in this. And uh, the Flat Earth Society is the largest organization of people that believe in this or like to talk about it, whatever they're doing. And they responded to Elon Musk's question very fast because they love questions and they love answers. And their response to his question, probably the greatest answer they've ever come up with. Why is there no Flat Mars Society, Elon Musk? ask. He said, hi, Elon. Thanks for the question. Unlike Earth, Mars has been observed to be round. We hope you have a fantastic day. And there you have it. Our planet is flat. Other planets are round. There are people out there that believe some pretty crazy things about the world we live in, the way the world works, and the way the world looks. And I think some of them know that, that what they are talking about and what they believe are crazy, but I think some people have, have convinced themselves and others that, that these views are, are not crazy. Um, now the internet has made it easier for people with weird views to express those and share those and connect with people, but people have had messed up views about the way the world works and the way that we live on the world for a long time. The internet's just made it easier, but these people have been around probably as long as people have been around. Today, I want to look at Luke chapter 13 together. Um, I want to read chap the beginning of chapter 13 of Luke together, uh, where 2,000 years ago, Jesus is ministering to some people that also have some strange views about the way the world works. And, and they're seeing those strange views in, in, in the world play out around them. And they're not really holding on to the context of the reality that God has come to share with us. So the beginning of chapter 13 of Luke says, now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus is teaching and, and, and they came to him and they filled Jesus in on this current event that had just happened. There are a group of Galileans who live north uh, in Israel that had gone down to Jerusalem to worship at the temple. They were offering sacrifices, and for some reason, the Roman guards, Pilate's guards, went in and attacked them, slaughtered them, killed them, and it says that their blood mixed with the blood of the animals that they were sacrificing. We don't have a lot of other historical evidence for this event happening because things like this tend to happen a lot, bad things happen a lot and, and um, we don't know exactly what was going on. We do know that the Romans, Herod had built a big Roman 
uh, fortress right next to the temple wall called the Antonia Fortress, and it overlooked both Jerusalem and it looked into the temple. And the Roman guards could stay up there and see who was in the temple, and it kept a check and a balance on them. And maybe these Galilean men had done something wrong. Um, maybe it was just Roman abuse and harassment. We don't know all the details. Either we, either way, we know that this horrible thing happened to these guys, and and word was spreading throughout the country about this next, this other horrible event that had happened. Jesus goes on in, in, in the second verse, and he says, he answers them, "Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners?" than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will perish. Jesus hears a story about these these Galilean men that get killed by the guards, and then he goes on to mention 18 people that, that died when this tower at the Pools of Siloam collapsed. There isn't a lot of historical information about this event either. It was probably just another current event that was, was recent in people's mind when Jesus is talking. But this thing happened, and it caused people pain, and it caused death, and, and, and the stories had traveled around the country that people talk about things like this. Jesus shares this the way that he does to point out um, one of the crazy views that people then and, and people now have about the world and the way the world works. They'd been looking at the world and they understood the world in a way that was not correct. And Jesus came to help us get a correct view of the world. You see, all the way back to the time of Job, Humans had believed that that calamity and natural disasters, unfortunate events, sickness and death was caused as a result of punishment for sin. That whenever these bad things happen, it was God punishing people for the sin that they had committed. And Jesus says that's not true. He says that that whether it's getting killed by soldiers during worship or a tower falling on them, um, it's not because... That, that, that they had sinned and this was some sort of punishment. And Jesus needs to correct this because this is not who God is. This is not God's nature. It's not how God treats us. Jesus tries to make this point clear to people 2,000 years ago. The problem is that, that even though he said it way back then and he's taught it way back then, um, there are still people that, that believe this and they think this about themselves and their own lives. That God has tried to prove to us, though, through everything that he's done, this is not the truth. God loves us and God is with us in the middle of all of this. But still so many people uh, have this messed up crazy view that God is not about love, that he's more about punishment. So many people still want to preach this view of God and teach this messed up view of God's character. And Jesus being fully God in the flesh with us, he comes to us and it's recorded in scripture to correct this idea. So we can see that this is not who he is. In this passage in Luke, we see the people asking Jesus the question that so many people still ask today. People that are searching for God, people that are wondering who this God really is that we worship. They ask the question, why do Why do bad things happen to good people sometimes? You know, why are there natural disasters that kill people? Why is there sickness like cancer and viruses or whatever else that that kill people and scare people? Why why do do people become victims of war and crime and the wickedness of, of other humans? How does this happen? And is it God punishing us for doing this, like some people say, or... Is God just absent in the middle of all of these things? And, and you know, I look around now and I've been in the stores and I've, I've seen people, um, what they're posting online, what they're sharing online, the thoughts that they're having. I've, I've been watching the news. And I see people now that are, are afraid. They're scared. Um, they're angry at the situations. They're worried. Um, they're confused all at the same time. And it's tough. It's hard to know that our neighbors and our friends, people we love, the people in our community, 
that I love, it's hard, it's heavy to see this happening. And it's not easy. But when I think about that, I, I, I think about Jesus in the middle of all of this too. And it's heavy for me, but I, I don't know all of the things that Jesus knows. And I can't see all the things that are really out there happening that Jesus sees happening. And I love people, but I don't love people nearly as much as Jesus loves people. So I know how it feels to me. And I know the weight that it is on us who love our neighbors and see suffering and not knowing what to do about it. So I can only imagine how much weight that is on our loving God and Father. To have people going through this. And it's, it's, it's here that Jesus has to answer this question. Hebrews says that for the joy set before him, for joy, Jesus chose to endure the cross for us, to endure that shame and that pain for us. He did these things. He chose with joy to be the connection for us, to connect the sacred that is him with the secular that it is us. He chose to be the one to bring life where there's death. He chose to be the one to bring light where there's darkness. Jesus chose to be the one to bring us peace in the middle of fear. That's a heavy task. That's a heavy weight for him to do, but he did it with joy because he wasn't interested in punishing us for our sin. No, he chose to be the one to take all the punishment for sin. What God's desire for the world is and has been from the very beginning was to deliver us from the punishment of sin, to deliver us from the pain. And when Jesus hears about it this day, he responds to them and he says, listen, you're right. These bad things keep happening, but you're wrong. It's not because of sinners. It's not because of sin. God loves people. He loves all people, sinners and people who used to be sinners but are now believers who are probably still actually sinners too. Jesus loves all of us. And Jesus is probably thinking, you know, you want me to explain why this stuff happens or how this stuff happens, but your, your views of, of an understanding of the reality of our creator and our God and creation are so messed up and separated that any explanation I give is just going to, to make it even more confusing. It's just something that maybe we don't grasp. Why do these things happen? It would be like trying to explain gravity to people that believe in flat earth who don't even believe in gravity. So making an explanation of it isn't going to land. It isn't going to help. So Jesus says, I can't answer that bad stuff happening. And we, d we don't know. He said, I, I can. I think one day he will. I think one day I'll explain it, but, but what's more important that I can tell you in the middle of all of this madness, in the middle of all of this pain, in the middle of all of these things that you're going to, he says, life and peace, they don't come to you who have never sinned, but life and peace come to you who repent of your sin. Life and peace come to you who change and choose to live instead of you who choose to die and continue into this. And, and, and we know he's talking about bigger things than just current events. He's talking about eternal ones. He's talking about eternal life. And, and, and he's talking about an abundant and overflowing life that, that he literally died so that we could have. This is what Jesus is interested in. You don't, you don't live that sort of life that is abundant and overflowing in the absence of bad things happening. No, you, you live it in spite of those bad things happening. You live it through those bad things happening. The natural disasters, unfortunate events, and pandemics, they don't in, 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 encroach upon abundant life. No, abundant life overflows into those situations. And to get to that abundant life, it's a life that we repent, that we stop doing things our ways and we start doing things his way. And that's what he's telling them. If you don't live that kind of life, these things will crush you. They'll destroy you and you will perish. But if you repent, you live things his way. They can't do that. I want to look at the next passage here. Then he told a parable 
a man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and I haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone one more year. I'll dig around it and I'll fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then, then cut it down. The fruit of a life lived the way that our creator intended us to uh, doesn't come through having perfect circumstances. It comes from letting him enter into the circumstances around us. We need to stop wasting so much time and energy expecting to make our circumstances what we think they need to be, trying to make our our circumstances what we think they need to be to live an abundant life, to live a good life. When we, we live like that, we start to sound crazy because we have to make excuses then as to why all of these circumstances we're trying to make right don't work out. We try to come up with answers and fixes and, 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 and it gets absurd. And it is not helpful anymore. To prop up a belief that that's how the world works, just it isn't true and it isn't beneficial. You know, the way that people that believe in the flat earth do. But Christians do this all the time. Non-Christians do this all the time. My life is broken and messed up, but there has to be a good answer. The true answer and the good answer is life doesn't work when we don't do it the way that we were created to live it. And that's the reality of the situation. If your life isn't bearing fruit, if it isn't abundant and overflowing, maybe it's time to stop doing things your way. And maybe it's time to start doing things his way because our ways tend to get crazier and crazier over time. Maybe it's time to stop looking at our world in a way that, that doesn't really exist and doesn't really make sense and doesn't work. It hasn't been working. And maybe it's time to start looking at our world the way that our creator intended us to see it. The way that the one who created us intended us to live in this world. Maybe it's time to repent, to change. Repent means to change. Maybe it's time to change and live a way that's going to actually work, that's going to actually bear fruit. And maybe we should do it before, before our trees get cut down and we don't have the chance to live that kind of life anymore. God loves you, and he created you to live, to really live. He doesn't do bad things to you because you've made mistakes. Even though sometimes our mistakes cause more bad things to happen to us, that's consequences. That's not divine intervention. No, God, God's on your side. He wants to help you with those consequences, and he certainly wants to help you with the bad things that are outside your control, not to punish you. Hear Jesus' truth today. He came here, and he stays here with us, so we don't have to deal with the punishment. He came here, and he stays here with us to stand as the in-between between us and that punishment. And to join us as we have to walk through dealing with the consequences that we brought upon ourselves. If, if you would just let go of the sin that had brought you to these places, if we would just let go of the sin that, that brought all of these bad things into the world in the first place, if we just let go of all of that stuff, and we would, we would repent, we would change, and we would have faith, and we would trust him. We live on a round planet. I don't want you to think I believe anything different. We live on a round planet. I, I believe it as much as I believe and trust everything that Jesus Christ has told us. And in this round planet that we live on, on this round planet that we live on, we are surrounded on all sides by an all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-loving God and Father. That's the truth. We, 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 we have a God who is is for us. And that God who is for us created us in such a way where he gave us, he gave us free will. And through that free will, sin has entered the world. We had the choice and we brought sin into the world. And with that sin came the diseases and the violence and the hatred and everything else. 
That free will can lead to that kind of life. But that free will can also lead to a life of repentance above and beyond that, a life of freedom, a life that is abundant, eternal, and overflowing. And that's the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your free will can either lead you to more pain and more suffering, or it can lead you to more life in the midst of pain and suffering. But it's our choice. We get to decide the way that we see the world around us and the world we believe in. There's a way that's a lie. Sin is always a lie, and there's a way that's a truth. And Jesus' way is the truth. But the choice is up to you. You get to decide. I would ask you to choose Jesus' way because it's the best way. No matter what the circumstances are outside, it's always the best way to live. And that's my prayer for you today. Would you choose Jesus' way? Have a fantastic day.